at Neuf Chapelle, published by White Dog Games. Uh, this is a boxed game with mounted counters, so a step up from previous productions by White Dog Games. This is a tactical game representing a World War I battle, actually the first major organized attack by the British. So we're gonna have a confrontation between British and German forces here. Uh, the British uh, historically achieved some good success early on in the battle and then things didn't go nearly as well as they had in the previous part of the battle. And the game um, represents that pretty well. It definitely portrays that problem. Um, it is a two-player game that, however, also plays well as a solitaire game because there are enough random factors, there are enough unpredictable events uh, that the game will remain fresh even if you're playing both sides by yourself at the best of your possibilities. Let me show how the game works now. This is the map of the game. Pretty good looking, pretty nice presentation. It is made of two paper maps that you place adjacent to one another and I place them under a piece of plexiglass here. Uh, here you have the setup of the historical scenario, at least one of the possible setups because you have general instructions uh, around which you can experiment with different types of placement. The British player starts with his units on or west of the British trench, which is this line here, well, completely covered with British units right now. But again, within that restriction, you can place units in different ways. And the German player starts with not many units on the board, as you can see, very weak units. And these units can be placed on or east of the German trench. And it is a good idea to place units in the available pillboxes, which you see, or say you do not see here, because there are units on top of those pillboxes. The uh, British player starts with a huge advantage and therefore the British player will try to make the most out of it by advancing as much as possible. These very few and scared German units really cannot do much but uh, delaying the unavoidable trying to slow down the British advance as much as possible. The game lasts three days, each day is divided in four day turns and a night turn. During the first night turn, the German player will receive these reinforcements that you see here that really are enough to give a big headache to the uh, British forces. The counterattack can be quite effective. Uh, so, starting from uh, the morning of the second day, the Germans are coming back and trying to regain terrain um, against the advantage that the British player may have acquired and should have acquired during day one. Not only this, but starting from turn three, the British player needs to roll a die each turn for each of his four divisions. And there is 50% chances that, that a division will remain inactive in the current turn. So this is why you have markers that you place on this area of the board here to indicate which uh, division of yours as the British player are inactive. So maybe one turn those two divisions will be inactive, next turn those, next turn only one, maybe really bad. Uh, the majority of your forces will be inactive. Just the Brits start being confused and they don't know what to do next. And it's pretty bad because the British player really uh, find it harder and harder to make even minimal gain after your initial push and more or less you will be forced to concentrate on defending whatever it is that you achieved in day one. Units only have one number printed on them, which is the combat factor, four points for full infantry units, two for reduced units, and when an infantry unit takes a second hit, it is eliminated, two points for cavalry units without a reduced side, and one point for the uh, units belonging to the German player that are initially on the map, and no reduced sight for them either. Each day turn starts with a weather check during which you roll 1d6, 1 to 3 the weather is clear, 4 to 6 it is misty. 
if the weather is misty, there's no artillery fire, that turn, if it is clear, well, you should expect a heavy rain of artillery and destruction, and also many die rolls that are needed to resolve artillery fire. Each player indeed receives a two artillery phases per turn. Again, that is a lot of artillery, but it is to be expected given the theme of the game. A day turn starts with the weather check, as I said. After that, you have the British artillery fire. British player rolls a die to determine the number of artillery attacks that are allowed. And British player places the markers to indicate the, act, the target axis. Then, to resolve those artillery attacks, the player rolls a die. There are modifiers to be applied mainly based on terrain of the defender. And well, the idea is that if you are attacking a, an X, which is just open terrain, the units there have 50% chances of being hit, and that means 50% chances, chances of being reduced or eliminated, of losing a step, in other words. 50%! That's, that's a lot! Yes, if you're moving in the open, it is pretty bad. Chances of being reduced or destroyed by artillery are high. Other types of terrain will reduce those chances to 1 in 3 instead of 1 in 2, and the best defense of them all is the trench. Units in each trench have a chance in 6 only of being hit. Also, if you are attacking enemy units adjacent to your own units, you need to attack your units too to see if they are hit by friendly fire. After artillery fire is resolved, the uh, British player can move his units up to his movement, up to their movement factor. And all infantry units have four movement points, cavalry units have eight movement points. Uh, enemy units project a zone of control in the six axes surrounding them. Also, clear terrain here causes two movement points. Only moving by road costs one movement point, so you will want to use your uh, road net as much as possible. And now the uh, phasing units are trying to get adjacent to the enemy units so that they can attack them. After British player has completed his movement, the British player declares assault and he places assault markers on the units that... Oops, that's not an assault marker. Uh, assault markers on the units that will attack in the following combat phase. But before these assaults are resolved, the German player will have a chance of executing defensive fire, which has two parts. It is split in two phases. The first is defensive artillery fire. So the German player receives an artillery fire that works just like the phasing player's artillery fire. German player now rolls a die to determine the number of artillery attacks, declares the artillery attacks, and then those artillery attacks are resolved one by one. After those artillery attacks have been resolved, the German player receives a, a, an opportunity uh, to use defensive fire proper. Basically, the units that are being assaulted can fire at the units that are assaulting them in case they are adjacent, and a unit can also fire at an enemy unit up to two axes away in case there is a clear line of sight and the enemy unit has an assault marker. Uh, to resolve that defensive fire, you really die, apply modifiers, and then you finally uh, as the facing player managed to resolve your assaults with the surviving units that you may still have or may not. As you can see, when you're launching an assault, there's a lot of stuff that you need to go through before you can resolve the assault. First, you receive artillery fire, then defensive fire from the units that you are uh, assaulting. And then finally, you get to resolve your attack, which is resolved at that point using a traditional uh, combat odd system. You compute the ratio between the total strength of the attackers and the strength of the defender. Uh, you look at the table, cross-reference that with a die roll, apply modifiers, and that will give you the result. Still, even in that phase, there are 
chances and pretty good chances in many cases that your attackers are going to uh, be uh, reduced in the attack. After the British assault combat, you have the German phase, which is very similar to the uh, British phase. The German player uh, will execute artillery fire, then the German player will move, will issue assault orders, the British player will execute defensive fire with artillery and defensive fire, and after that the German assaults are resolved and the turn is over. And this is how day turns work. During night turns the players do not get to uh, act with the exception of the German reinforcements during the first night turn, but very important the players get to place these markers under their, the, their units. These markers represent temporary trenches that are dug during the night and they are very good to protect your units when they are out in the field because, as I said, otherwise artillery can be pretty devastating. Artillery attacks can take a huge toll on your units. Thanks to that, thanks to these markers, you will be able to create new lines at the end of at the end of each day. The rule book is only four page long, so very short rule book, and it is overall pretty clear. I only had a couple of doubts, one or two minor doubts, uh, no big problem. Um, even though the rules are so simple, still you can see that a lot of effort was put in trying to tailor those rules to historical events and in the attempt uh, to create an historical feel. And I think that actually this really works. This is uh, an important part of the design, probably this is my favorite part. The game has a strong historical feel. Uh, you definitely see uh, some aspects of World War I, uh, such as the enormous importance of artillery, the crucial importance of trenches, the enormous expenditure in human lives and resources just to achieve a minimal and extremely precarious advantage that you may lose after just a little bit. It doesn't get any more World War I than that. This is really it is really a portrait of the situation that works from that point of view. Uh, on the other hand, in order for that to work, there are procedures that you need to implement that don't feel particularly elegant, that at times simply feel burdensome in terms of gameplay. Each turn, uh, the markers that you have to add to the board and take out and put back uh, are of a considerable uh, quantity. Each turn, if uh, there is clear weather, you're gonna have first artillery, then assault markers, then artillery markers again, then you take them out, then artillery markers again, assault markers again, and artillery markers again. There were times in which, say, I had three or four turns in a row where the weather was clear, uh, artillery was used, and at the end I just felt that the all that implementing of procedures was slowing down the game and were just breaking down the pace and making the action overall less engaging. On the other hand, I wouldn't know how to solve that really because it is an important part of the design to be forced to commit to assaults before you know um, which of your units are actually going to survive and actually get alive to the position of the opponent to commit to artillery fire in certain locations before you see the result of the previous artillery attacks. Those are interesting choices as you're making them, but they may slow down the game and they may slow down the pace of the game, making the experience overall a little less tight. A lot of die rolls, if you don't like to roll dice, this is a game that is not going to appeal to you. So, um, I think that you can get a good uh, picture of this historical event represented in the game and on top of that you can have also a sense of the feel of those events more than anything really this incredible World War One feel of what it really means to leave the trenches, uh, launch an attack, see your forces incredibly reduced just to gain a little bit of something and you lose it after an hour. 
uh, that is that is that's interesting. If you're interested in history, it is an interesting way of experiencing that, of remembering those events, remembering those tragedies. Again, there's a trade-off. There's a price to pay in terms of playability. So, uh, putting together the pluses and minuses of the design, I would say that for somebody who is interested in history and historical gaming, this is a good game. This is good. Not a game that you will play for a hundred of times, but a game that has enough historical feel and it is accessible in terms of rules. For a historical game, I feel that I feel that this is a game that gets the job done, and it is a game that, in that frame of mind, uh, as a, as a survey, as a first-hand experience of these historical events, it is a game that I enjoyed.